Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Fifty Shades of Tay. I am joined by the one, the only, Cody Leach today. How are you doing, Cody? I am doing good. It's been a busy day. Uh, had new internet hooked up, and then it worked until you emailed me, and oh, then it no. stopped working. So I had to hook up the old internet in a panic really quick. But other than that, we're good. <laughs> Shenanigans. I've been having power issues because it's been like 115 degrees here in mm. L.A. all week long. So they've been like having power outages everywhere. The Hollywood Bowl yesterday had a power outage. They had to cancel the concert. Wow. I know. I was just in Arizona and it was 103. I thought that was miserable. So <laughs> I feel I for you. I can't do it. I can't do it. Uh, I went to Disneyland this morning for like an hour. And mm -hmm. it was, I went around like 8 a.m. And it was already like 90 degrees. And Ugh. I was like, I'm out of here. I can't. Yeah, no, no, not that early. Uh, but something that we're going to talk about right now, um, your favorite horror movie. I, I rewatched it last night because I haven't seen it in a long time. And I was jealous because there's a lot of uh, cold weather in it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but Cody, what is your favorite horror movie? My favorite horror film of all time is John Carpenter's The Thing. Uh, it's often in competition with that and The Lost Boys. But over the last couple of years, I've just kind of permanently sat the crown on onto The Thing. Um, I just think it's a perfect film. I think it represents everything that I love about horror. Uh, a lot of the things that I, I kind of miss about horror sometimes that isn't done quite as well anymore. And anytime I want to like give somebody an idea of like what my movie taste is, it's like, here, just sit down and watch this. That's me. Oh, and rewatching it last night, I had to cover my dog's eyes because there's a lot of dog <laughs> violence in there. And she was very into it because she likes, she likes anything with dogs or Tom Holland. I, mm. I don't know why she'll watch any Spider-Man movie from start to finish without blinking. But oh, um, wow. I was like, don't look, don't look. Cause she doesn't need to see the, <laughs> the violence, but I just love all the practical effects that are in this mm -hmm. film. And I, whenever people can do practical, that's like the number one thing I say, uh, what is something that stood out to you when you saw this film for the first time? And do you remember the very first time you ever saw it? I somewhat it probably was when my dad threw the laser disc on my dad was a really big into collecting movies back in the day I've since like totally usurped him with the I don't even know if you could see the collection back there but like a ton of blu-rays but uh yeah I, I'm pretty sure he just threw the laser disc on one day and a lot of my movie like cherished stories start out with that me and my dad sat down and then you know um the rest is history but uh I, I'm pretty sure when I saw it I didn't really know what it was. I recognized Kurt Russell, obviously. I'd seen him in a number of things at that age. And I think I was just blown away by like how quickly it gets into it with the the dog cage scene and how nasty it gets. And as you said, the practical effects where it's just like never seen rubber do that before. <laughs> you know, all this crazy things and the, the mouth opening up and some other thing coming out. And yeah, to this day, I still kind of call this like the Bible of practical effects work and there's a lot of incredible horror films that that are in that conversation but for me it's never better than the thing so it was that the practical effects work and just like how well he captured paranoia which i think i even kind of tapped into even as a kid was just like wow these guys just don't trust each other at all now and seeing how that unfolds and uh it, it's so many things about it but yeah i'm pretty sure it was just the nastiness it was uh, all, all all the the crazy practical effects and stuff that just grabbed me from a kid. It's funny you mentioned laser discs because that's how I watched a lot of movies growing up at home too. And mm -hmm. it's weird because I feel like we're young, <laughs> young enough to like not know about laser discs, but we both uh -huh. know about them. And um, I mentioned them to like a lot of people our age and they have no idea what I'm talking about, but they're giant. They're like vinyl size. And um, heavy. what's, <laughs> yeah, they're heavy. What's crazy <laughs> is I had Titanic on laser disc growing up right but it was like four discs and they were double-sided mm -hmm. and i didn't really understand like side a side b disc one you know and uh, i would just put it on randomly so sometimes the boat would be above water sometimes the boat would be underwater and i don't know i don't know the first time i ever saw titanic in chronological order because i could never figure it out <laughs> but man yeah. laser discs I had a lot of memories as a kid of trying to watch things on Laserdisc, but as a kid, they're so cumbersome and you don't want to like touch it. And so you're like trying to hold it like this and you feel like you're going to drop it and scratch it. And then, yeah, having to flip it over. I mean, just for regular length movies, they were always double sided. And then you get into things like Titanic where it's like you got to have a whole box set of them. Crazy, crazy. Mm -hmm. How many times do you think by now that you have watched the thing? Oh, wow. Um, 
at least into the 30s or 40s. Mm. Like, I almost wish I would have thought back in the day to like keep a log of some of these because I'd really be fascinated to figure out what the top 10 movies I've actually rewatched are. Yeah. But uh, it, it's one of those movies that, you know, there was probably six or seven different films that me and my dad would continuously just put on just for comfort. There was this, it doesn't make any sense why it was comforting, but movies like Pet Cemetery, uh, we would just throw on to kind of like get the thrills. And then that carried on to whenever I was in my 20s single. And then especially after I got with my wife and started to have kids, all of a sudden it's it's like indoctrinating the new generation. <laughs> like you got to sit down and watch this. And so uh, it's one of those movies that I got to watch at least once a year. So it's got to be at least in the 30s or 40s. Yeah, that's crazy. I wish there was some kind of app because there's letterbox, but you can only mm -hmm. mark a movie off once. But if they mm -hmm. had something where you could like mark it off every time you watch it, because I'd be curious too. some of my favorite movies. I have no clue how many times I'd put them on. Yeah, mine would be nuts. It would be like the Lost Boys next to Uncle Buck next to like Johnny Tsunami or something crazy. So oh <laughs> it'd be gosh. hilarious to see it. Mine would be, let's see, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, because I watch that every year on my birthday. Uh, mm -hmm. Chicago, because I am obsessed with that movie. And then probably the original Scream, because I watched that, I'd say like on a monthly basis at this point. So I don't know mm -hmm. how many times I've seen those three movies. <laughs> yeah, I've got some of those too. Die Hard is one that I watch every single year and uh, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles every single Thanksgiving. So those those annual watches for sure would be up there. Yeah. Oh, man, that's true. Who is your favorite character in The Thing? Oh, man, uh, there's so many. And that's one of the things that I love about this. Like a lot of movies that try to do this ensemble cast you always feel like a chunk of the characters you don't even really get to know that much. And somehow John Carpenter was able to give you just enough about every character where every one, even the ones that die quickly, you kind of feel like you know enough about them. Uh, it's probably not the most interesting answer in the world because they're the two characters that are left alive by the end of it, or are they? Uh, but uh, Kurt Russell and Keith David's character. So uh, you got Childs and then you have McCready. I, I think McCready's interesting because it's not like it's not an obvious final guy character, if you will. Like he doesn't really come across as like the leader of the group. He's just the helicopter pilot with the weird sombrero. And so it's only through the events of the movies where you start to see like how this character ticks and how everybody else jump into conclusions. He's actually trying to like keep calm and figure things out and coming up with the blood test and things. And what I love about Childs is just, he's so unapologetically Keith David the entire movie is just does not care, does not want to hear any BS uh, all, all, all the way to the end of it. He's kind of the guy who says the wrong thing. And there's just something about that personality type that I like. And those two, like they're like the perfect marriage of two characters to go through the movie. And at the same time, they're like fire and gasoline. Uh, <laughs> and so just those two together, I think, are, are, are the most fun ones to me. But I also get a big kick out of uh, Wilford Brimley's character, even oh, though you yeah. don't get a lot out of him. The few scenes that you get are just very memorable because he just goes from quiet doctor to guy who seems like he's insane to a guy who's suddenly really scared for his life to, you know, the final boss at the end of it. Yeah. Oh, man. I can't wait to honestly watch it again, even though I just watched it last night, because like we've mentioned a couple of times, the practical effects, the the paranoia. Can you think mm -hmm. of if if someone out there is like a big fan of the theme? Are there other movies that you would say are in the similar vein that you would recommend to them with like that paranoia and just like the suspense? Oh man, that's a good question. I probably had to prepare for that one. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, paranoia. I know. I can't really think of one off the top of my head either. Yeah. Off the top of my head. It's kind of hard. Uh, um, Circle back to that question and let okay. me think about it for a few minutes. That's one I probably would have had to prepare for. But yeah, I'm sure there is. There's not really one that doesn't like the thing, uh, right. not even the the prequel. But uh, it's uh, paranoia movies are interesting because it always puts characters in like these little bottle situations mm -hmm. and just kind of pressure cook them. And this is one where uh, the, the interesting thing about this, the, the setting of the thing being in, in Antarctica is mm -hmm. that it's one of those brilliant mixes that I love when a, a horror movie can combine where you have this vast openness, you could leave, you can get away anytime you want, but it's so isolated because of the openness. Yeah. Like you can go anywhere, but you can't go anywhere. Yeah, good luck. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's one of the things that I, uh, I like a lot about the way that the thing does it. But yeah, let me, let me think on that for a few minutes while we keep right. talking and I'll hopefully I'll come up with one. I know, I'm going to try and think of something too. The only thing I could think of is like, hmm, maybe something like contagion only because everyone's paranoid about getting sick and like it's spreading. 
Mm-hmm. That's the only thing that, like, like Night of the Living of. Dead or any kind of zombie movie, Dawn of the Dead. Oh, yeah, yeah, thing. that's true. Like, who's All bit? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Have you ever, uh, amongst your many rewatches, thought about how you would do in the situation if you were in the film, if you were a character in this movie and it was real? <laughs> how do you think you would do and what do you think you would do? I I probably would be one of those guys who's like, quieter about it trying to assess the situation i don't know if i would necessarily be as take charge as mccready because it's such a weird situation that comes out of nowhere like i'm one of those guys that I, I i wouldn't immediately doubt everybody but at the same time i'd be like i don't know i need to like I need to get in my head a little bit and try to figure this out so maybe uh the closest i could probably come to is um the character who's like the dog wrangler. I'm forgetting his name and I'm ashamed that I'm forgetting his name (laughs) because I love this movie. But uh, yeah, the one that he has the scalpel and then he gets shot and ends up being human. Hmm. Something about the way that he's kind of quietly assessing the situation, I feel like is probably more how I would be. I wouldn't be the loud uh, guy protesting everything and I wouldn't be the one losing their mind like, you know, uh, windows trying to (laughs) run around and grab guns and stuff like that. So probably some one of those characters and hopefully not get shot in the middle of the movie. Yeah, that's that's what I think too, because my favorite horror franchise is Scream, and whenever mm. I watch these movies, I'm always trying to see if I can figure out who the killer or killers are. Mm-hmm. And I feel like if I was in that movie, I would keep my thoughts to myself. I wouldn't trust anyone, and I would just sit back and just, where was this person when this happened? And how do those yeah. two people know each other? And that's the, kind of the mindset I would go into the situation of the thing with. Exactly. I'm one of those people that like, obviously having a YouTube channel, like I can talk if I need to, but I'm a listener. I'm somebody that, that kind of sits back and, and assesses things and kind of lets people tell me who they are. You know what I mean? So I, I'm kind of one of those characters. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. Very good. Very good. Is there anything in the film that you would change if you knowing what you know now, and maybe with like today's technology and all that kind of stuff, is there anything you would go back and you would change or adjust this is one of the few movies where I actually don't think there's anything that can be improved on. Uh, I, I love everything about it. I love the way that the practical effects work. I love the casting. I love the pacing of the movie. Um, yeah, th- there's an argument that maybe the third act gets a, like the final boss is taken care of perhaps a little too quick. Mm. But I think that adds to the pacing of the movie, just getting in and getting out before it kind of stretches too thin. And I actually am one of those people that love the fact that the ending is ambiguous. It's very similar to... Um, inception for me Mm. where i feel like uh the debate that's been going on for decades of like is this character the thing is this character the (laughs) thing to me it's more about the fact that they still don't trust each other and they still don't know Mm -hmm. uh and so that's kind of what i always take away from it i know there's a lot of theories out there about like the glimmer in the eyes and the 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 breath in the cold and you know there's people that think that um mccready handed him a bottle of gasoline as a Hmm. test and he's drinking liquor and it's actually gas and now he knows that there's all kinds of funny little ways and of course john carpenter has said like i know who the thing is but i'll never tell uh i just love the fact that it just kind of brings home that paranoia and that distrust home where it really doesn't matter they could both Hmm. be the thing they could both be human the fact is they got through all of this and nothing has changed and now they're just they're doomed to sit there and wait yeah very true uh We're getting a lot of like legacy sequels lately. We just got Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice in theaters, the new mm-hmm. Ghostbusters, Frozen Empire. Would you want a sequel or a kind of remake of this? Or do you want it just left alone as is? It has to have the caveat of having practical effects. Yeah. I would be more than willing to see somebody else take on this story and take on this world if they're going to stick to that. Because I actually think that the prequel that they came out with is is really good narratively but it's destroyed by that CGI stuff that they put on there. And it's a shame too, because they, they actually use practical monsters and then they just got cold feet at the end of it in the studio, painted it over with last minute CGI. And it just, to me, it kills it. It, it is like, you just lost the entire appeal of this franchise. So I know Blumhouse has been talking about it for a while. Supposedly they're doing something like that, which kind of worries me. I'm not the biggest Blumhouse fan, but oh, um, I, I, I would be more than willing to to give them a shot to do a sequel or to do a remake or to something in this world. 
as long as they're going to keep it practical. I think that is the most important piece that uh, would so easily get missed by studio reps nowadays. Hmm. And that's all it would take for me to lose faith. You could have John Carpenter executive producing it, writing the script, doing the score. Any Morricone could come back and do the score. You could have all the names in the world giving it credit. And they say, but it's going to be CGI. And I'm going to go, nope, never mind. Not watching it. Don't care. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that I, I'm more... Um, I'm more forgiving on legacy sequels and, and remakes and just the thought of going back to classic films than most people, but you got to have that one piece of it. Yeah. And that's something I think Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice did really well. Lots of practical I effects. Um, I think it was HGTV has a video on their YouTube channel right now where they visited the set and then they show like how all the flooring in the underworld is uneven. So they had to build furniture to be straight on an uneven floor. And I thought that was incredible. And that's something you don't really think about when you're watching the movie and Alien Romulus, which just came out as well, like mm -hmm. a month ago, uh, that one had lots of practical effects too. Even though I have some issues with it, uh, the practical effects in there yeah. really, to me, like took it up a notch. So I agree with you 100%. I would love to see more in this world. If they're going to go and revisit it and tell more in this world, I would love just bring on the practical effects. Yeah, absolutely. And those are good examples of finding the right mix. I think nowadays it's kind of impossible to not have a little CGI in there, but it should be, they should be married together to have the best end product. And we just have so many more examples of them using too much CGI or using CGI. That's not really given it's, it's time to be fully rendered out to look convincing. Uh, but those two movies did a great job of starting with practical, trying to have as much practical as you can while, you know, no pun intended, being practical, you know, with how much you have to use, uh, but using CGI to just kind of enhance it and kind of mix it together. And the best movies, in the, especially in the horror genre, find a way to do both. Like there was a movie a couple years ago, Smile, that oh, I, yeah. saw the, I saw the world premiere of it at Fantastic Fest. And when you get to the end and you get that smile monster where he opens his face and I swore it was CGI mm -hmm. because it looked so good. And then the, luckily the director came out and did a Q&A right after that. And he said, oh, no, that's all practical. We just kind of touched it up a little here and there. And it's like, ah, yes, please, more like you. Yeah, that is crazy. I thought the same thing. I thought that was 100% CGI. And then I think it was on Twitter. There was like a behind the scenes video. And I was like, mm -hmm. no way. That and in Barbarian, um, yeah. I saw a screening of that where there was a Q&A right after. And I thought the, the mother character, I was like, I don't know if that's real or not. And then the actor that played the mother character came out right after and was like, yeah, I was in a suit. I was like, oh my God, that's great. I just, I love yeah. knowing that kind of stuff. And they just did it too with uh, Alien Romulus, the guy who was in the suit for yeah, that was the wild. creature at the end. I was like, <laughs> oh my God, that's a real person. That blows my mind. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, and that that's the funny thing about nowadays. Like back in the day, you knew it had to be real. And if they had mm. to do digital, it was obvious because it didn't look very good. But nowadays they've gotten it down to a science on the film productions that do it the best where you can't quite tell. Yeah. And, you know, you want to think CGI because it looks so good. And then you find out it's practical and it just like it warms your little horror heart. Yeah, it really does. Uh, so we're getting closer and closer to Halloween and people are starting to put together their Halloween watch list. If you had to recommend some of your other favorite horror movies for people to check out this Halloween season, what would you recommend? Oh, wow. So one that is just great for the holiday vibe is uh, Trick or Treat, which is um, actually there's two movies called Trick or Treat that I'll talk about. One is Trick or Treat, which is uh, a horror anthology film. Uh, most people know Sam, the little the sackhead with the little br uh, broken lollipop. I love that film because it's all about just like Halloween lore and Halloween um, urban legends and things like that brought together. So that's a great movie to get you in that October feeling. Uh, then there's a film from 1986 called Trick or Treat, which is a heavy metal horror film. So if you're not a heavy metal fan, a lot of it might go over your head. But uh, essentially, it's uh, where you have a rock star of the 80s that dies and his biggest fan finds this vinyl of his last recordings. And when he plays it backwards, which is a big thing in the 80s, hidden messages on, on vinyls, when he plays it backwards, he can talk to his favorite artist from beyond the grave. And he like helps him get revenge on bullies and stuff. And it starts to get really That's sinister. So cool. it, it's a little corny because it's a lower budget <laughs> film. But if you grew up with it, it's awesome. Or if you're just a big heavy metal fan, you get all the references. But mm -hmm. I love that one just because it, it, it also kind of brings the holiday uh, home for me. I'm a massive fan of Hocus Pocus. The, the original. That's one that uh, me and my family always watch on Halloween night. That's kind of our annual one. So I love that one. 
uh, you have to tap into something in the Halloween franchise. And I'm actually going to suggest people give Season of the Witch a shot. Ooh, everybody right, always right. recommends 1978. And I feel like everybody's seen that movie and we're tired of talking about it. At least I am. But Season of the Witch, uh, I would say more so than probably any of the Michael Myers films, really goes for the Halloween holiday with the Halloween masks that are going to murder all the children. And <laughs> it's just wicked. So yeah. that one's a really great one. And uh, for a more modern one that I like to throw on just for intensity in October is the Fede Alvarez Evil Dead film. Oh my God, That's I one love that, that I, one. Yes, I threw that on to watch with my wife one year, and that kind of became an October staple for us because it's just so visceral, and you get the the woods and the deadites and the rain and blood, and mm -hmm. it's just it's the more intense side of the the Halloween vibe for me. So those those would be my recommendations, but oh, I have like are, oh. dozens more probably. Great, yeah. Fede Alvarez's uh, Evil Dead is like one of the rare exceptions where a remake of a horror film, I think. I hate saying it. I hate saying it, but like surpasses the original. I just, I'm obsessed with, yeah, I am obsessed with his take on that film. And I just, mm -hmm. I love it so much. I love Evil Dead. For me, it goes Scream, then it goes Evil Dead. And then I, I am honestly thinking Terrifier might be like my third favorite horror oh, franchise. Okay, cool. Yeah, what about you? What other like horror franchises are you into? Uh, my top two franchises are Nightmare on Elm Street and Child's Play. Those are the oh. ones that I grew up on that were, you know, Child's Play 3 was my first horror flick. And that one really kind of like opened the doors for me. And then I saw, I think it was Nightmare on Elm Street 4, if I'm not mistaken, was the next one. And that was just like, these movies are awesome. I'm never <laughs> watching Disney again. Uh, and so those two are my top two. But I really love uh, what they've done with the Evil Dead franchise. I've kind of slowly become a massive fan of that because, you know, they've only had, what, five films and they're all very true to what the franchise is while being very different. Uh, so I think the I think Scream and probably even more so Evil Dead are the two examples of horror franchises that have had the most consistent quality yeah. as they've gone on. Uh, and then let's see. It's tough because all the other horror franchises, I feel like there's like two or three good ones. And then a, and then a lot, lot of stuff of you ones. really don't like. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, oh, so it, the Halloween franchise is fun. I'm certainly becoming a fan of Terrifier. I like the second one quite a bit. Yeah, so um, good. Phantasm. I'll throw Phantasm Ooh. out there. All right, all right. And, and, and that's one where I would say only the first two I'll really defend with a lot of passion. The other three, if you don't like, I'm not... Oh, okay, cool, I get it. <laughs> but uh, I love those movies, and they, those were just as influential for me as, as Nightmare and Child's Play. I love Phantasm. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so I have to tell you a story about Evil Dead Rise. Okay. So I saw that movie and I'm obsessed with it. Like, I think it's so good. It's a great addition to the Evil Dead franchise. You know, the cheese grater scene, right? Yes. So I took my boyfriend with me to go see this movie. He knows how much I love Evil Dead. That's the only reason he went. He's not into gore or violence or any of that blood and guts stuff. So <laughs> Wrong when the movie grater, for him. <laughs> yeah. When the cheese grater scene came on, he was not very happy with me. And um, ever since then, it's been an ongoing gag where I just like hide our cheese grater, like in different <laughs> cabinets and cupboards in the refrigerator. And he's gone right now. So honestly, when we're done with this, I'm going to go hide the cheese grater. <laughs> and then um, just like a couple months ago, I interviewed the director of the upcoming uh, Evil Dead movie. And I asked him because he can't, you know, say anything really about the movie, mainly because they haven't started it yet. But I asked mm -hmm. him, I was like, uh, is there going to be any cheese grater in this movie? And he was like, I, <laughs> I can't say, but I, mm. I hope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. That's awesome. <laughs> well, a couple more questions just since we're getting closer to Halloween. What mm -hmm. is your go to Halloween candy? Oh, man. That's a tough one. I'm actually one of those weirdos that really likes Almond Joys and Mounds. I know that always ends up on the list of like the worst Halloween candy, but I just really <laughs> like coconut and chocolate for some reason. So I'll give that a shout out All right. uh, as well as candy corn. You know, the ca candy corn haters need to stop. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I really like Starburst quite a bit, but I'll get very angry if you because you usually get the two packs mm -hmm. and I get really mad when I get the two lemons yep. <laughs> like that'll put me in a bad mood. Uh, so Starburst is really good up there. Uh, I love whenever we get some airheads. Mm. Um, those are some good ones from my my youth. And you don't see them too much anymore. But the candy that used to always say Halloween to me was those little candy cigarettes that we used to get in the 90s. Oh. Where they're just the little sugar sticks. Yeah. And they were never really marketed as cigarettes in my generation. It was mm. always just like, you know, a, a ghoul. And then it was just a bunch of white sticks. But I don't never see them anymore, I guess, because it's just they don't want to promote that at all, which I understand. 
But that's one from my youth that I used to love getting those. For some yeah, reason, I just the plain that. Jane sugar sticks yeah. used to scream Halloween to me. You know what you just reminded me of? Do you remember those? They were also from the 90s. They were like lollipops that were like caramel apple lollipops and a green wrapper. Yep. Yep. Oh, my God. I don't know if those still exist, but if they're out there, I need them because oh, I yeah. just right now that reminded me of those. And it's like, oh, man. All right. There's a lot about... of that good stuff from the 90s that for some reason feels like these like things that were discontinued quietly and then we just didn't find out till 10 years go by we didn't see it we're like where's that go where's that go the other candy i was just thinking about the other day too was do you remember um it was gum and it had like a zebra on it and they were like striped and they were like giraffe stripe. ones. that's the name of it fruit stripe yeah oh it's, it's infamous for having flavor for about eight seconds yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i remember that i would get it every time i went to toys r us that's like the only place i knew of that sold it is that mm -hmm. the thing still or it's probably gone huh I, I honestly i don't know i haven't seen it in a long time yeah. but any anytime i hear it brought up it's just to make the joke of how like by the it third lasts, chew yeah, yeah. it's out of flavor damn simpler times when we had good candy <laughs> yep exactly all right what about halloween costumes do you have a favorite halloween costume that you've ever dressed up as oh man i try to do something different every single year and this year i've already bought two things i'm going to dress up as leatherface from the 2003 film so that's going to be a fun one um, I've dressed up as Michael Myers a number of times because I've had uh, a couple different versions of the masks as the new films have come out. I actually had a fan send me one that they uh, they painted and restrung the hair themselves, and it looks damn near movie quality from Halloween Kills. Uh, so I've dressed up as Michael a number of times. I dressed up as Snake Plissken last year uh, from Escape from New York. Um that one was actually a really fun one. I'll say that one for now because it was it was a costume that nobody recognized except for like the old school parents. Everybody thought I was a pirate because I just have the eye patch and it was just long black hair and a sleeveless shirt and camo pants and a little toy gun. And everybody's like, look at the pirate. And I'm like, God, this generation's killing me. And then you'd get like three parents the entire night. They're like, hey, snake. And I'm like, thank you, God. That's hilarious. Mm -hmm. I... Don't think I could wear any of my um, old costumes today. I think I would get in a lot of trouble because you know how they had the like adult section and they were like the really inappropriate ones. Yes. When I was in high school, I thought it was uh, the cool thing to be like the condom or I was super sperm one year. It was just like a giant <laughs> sperm with like a cape. And it's like, I can't imagine like now as an adult walking around in public like that. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. So I need to think of something <laughs> this year because I haven't I haven't done since COVID, like I haven't dressed up for Halloween and it sucks because it's like my favorite holiday and I just feel like I'm sitting on the sidelines. So I got to figure out something soon. There's a spirit Halloween down the street for me. Mm -hmm. I spend way too much time there, but oh, uh, yeah. I got to, I got to figure out something. Well, you can bridge the gap because I've seen they have hot tuba costumes this year. They have oh. the, the <laughs> like their jumpsuits and they have the logos. So that's <laughs> kind of dirty and kind of mainstream at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> And or if I was creative, I really wish I knew how to like create my own costume. Same. Because people who like spend hours and hours and then they're like gorgeous to look at. It's like, I don't know how to do any of that stuff. Yeah. I went down that rabbit hole for about a half an hour yesterday because I was like, I want to I want to go to websites and figure out how people put this costume together because I don't want to just order the generic one. And every video and poster and picture I saw looked phenomenal. But there was like no instruction whatsoever on how they did it. They were just like, look what I made. And I'm like, oh my gosh, can you give me a link or something? Like, where do I go? And so as far as I've gotten is the trick or treat studios mask. Ooh. And I ordered uh, a shirt that has been pre weathered and stained up by somebody on Etsy that cost me $200. Oh my God. So, well, that's cool yeah. though. That's, that's you're getting there. I feel like that's like a good entryway into then next year mm -hmm. you do it. You're like, you know, you start, start with that. Mm -hmm. Start prepping in about April, weathering a shirt, yeah. washing it every day. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, Cody, I cannot thank you enough for joining me for this very first episode of my favorite horror movie. And it has been so much fun getting to meet you. This is our first time ever like meeting. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Absolutely. I appreciate but, the invite. It was fun. Yeah, very fun. We got to figure out something to do with Rob. I know he has his 1000th episode of Rob Servations coming up and he's going to live stream for a thousand hours. I don't know. <laughs> I don't well, know how that's like humanly possible. But I want to come in on like hour 900 and just see what he looks like. Yeah. Maybe we just like crash the stream or offer to like cover yeah. for 15 minutes. Yeah, exactly. Go take a nap. We got it. Oh man. Well, Cody, in the meantime, where can people follow you and keep up with all your 
amazing reviews. I've been watching um, Afraid. I just watched that one that you did. I know how much you love that movie. Honestly, oh, I'm yeah. shocked you didn't pick Blumhouse's Afraid to talk about today. But where can people follow you? <laughs> Uh, so I was not very creative in 2016 when I made my channel. So all you have to do is search my name, Cody Leach. So you'll search that. I should be the first like 1700 results. Uh, and then in uh, pretty much all the other platforms, Instagram, Twitter, everywhere else, I've tried to market it as just Cody Leach YT to make it easier to find me there too. So pretty easy to find. Uh, if you like movies, I try to review all genres and all new releases that I have time to, but there's definitely a horror focus is what I call in my channel. So come check it out. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, you guys go check it out because his reviews are very well put together and very thoughtful. And I could only uh, hope to have reviews out like that one day. So thank you again, Cody. Thank you. It's been a pleasure speaking with you and so nice to meet you. Absolutely. You too, sir. Happy Halloween. <laughs> you as well. Bye. Bye.